Hello and welcome. My name is Mike Barsick. Hello, and I'm Steve Hertzleib. And uh, Mike and Steve are here to perform a webinar today, and our topic is uh, combustion safety in small commercial buildings. And uh, Steve, can you tell us a little bit about your combustion safety experience? Yeah, and I do have to start off with a, a small disclaimer in that most of my combustion um, or I guess just a disclaimer, most of my combustion safety experience is in the residential side. Um, and so I'm coming at it with, um, you know, from, from that angle. Um, but, uh, and, you know, one of the reasons why I'm here with this mic doing this webinar is basically a lot of uh, the previous work in combustion safety um, comes from residential. Um, you know, and in commercial, it's, uh, we're, we're hoping to start to see this, you know, being acknowledged more and more. Um, but uh, you know we're kind of paving a little bit new ground here, um, and um, and I'd like to also point out too that that um, this is for uh, small commercial buildings here. Um, so a lot of these buildings, you know, they could be quite different from residential, but some of them could be quite similar as well. Um, oh. And we'll see a few case studies a little bit later that you know that'll yeah. uh, we'll we're not that hearing out. us. Uh, yeah, we may we may not be on audio. Um, okay. So we need to do mic and speakers. Hello? Can you hear me now? <laughs> um, we're trying to get the audio working here. We're not sure it's working. Yeah, if any uh, participants wouldn't mind shooting a message in the notes, and if you can hear us, indicating that. Hearing you fine, says Ingrid. Okay. okay. Ingrid says she can hear us. So just in case you missed it uh, in the beginning, um, my name is Mike Barsick, and I'm here with Steve Hertzlieb, and we're going to talk about commercial, uh, small commercial buildings, and uh, particularly in the topic of um, combustion appliance safety. Uh, Steve, we haven't done a webinar in a little little while, but I did look and I found a picture of us from the last webinar. <laughs> there we are, right there. Yeah. Is that you in the brown jacket or the sweater? I think. Um, I'm I'm on the left there. I I like a pleather. Yeah. That's really. I prefer it's a, good, it's a good look. All right. Good. We'll go with that, and uh, in the meantime, we'll we'll talk about small commercial uh, combustion safety. And um, this is a document that was premier, uh, prepared primarily by me, um, so it has a lot of sort of my experience, my opinions in it. But um, tried to make some code references and so on. And we're not going to actually have a PowerPoint for this um, presentation. We're going to look through this document talk about other things, but we are going to see a lot of pictures, so don't, don't, don't think we're going to read the document to you. That sounds exciting. <laughs> um, and then we also want to say this is a part of a toolkit that is designed around um, combustion safety in commercial buildings. And the target audience, I guess, would be people that do assessments of small commercial buildings, or if you're a designer of small commercial buildings, or a facilities operator in small commercial buildings, or anything like that. That this hopefully will will bring some valuable information. Anything you want to add? I'll just say you know there is the the toolkit, the um, um, an Excel um, sheet that we'll um, be going through a little bit later. Um, that you know is uh, useful for um, you know an assessor doing an assessment, a data collection form that does calculations. Um, but like Mike said, you know the assessors are, are you know primary target for the audience. But um, you know, um, um, operations, building operations, or even just occupants of, of commercial buildings, you know, can can benefit from what we're going through over today. Um, also, too, it's worth mentioning that um, this is a, a, a work in progress, and we'll be talking about some things. Um, and as combustion safety, especially in commercial buildings, gains more and more attention, um, you know, hopefully there's going to be more and more. Um, you know, structured scientific studies that are going to provide more data um, that we can um, use to, you know, in, improve these guidelines. Yeah. Well, in fact, that's a great comment, Steve, because as you go into, I'm going to, I'm going to scroll up here to this. Uh, there's a few definitions we will be talking about these items. But as we get into the executive summary, um, I would kind of say this document is acknowledging that we have been testing and we have been studying combustion safety in homes 
for a while. I think we have to give credit to groups like uh, the Building Performance Institute uh, and the Weatherization Program um, and uh, air conditioning contractors and uh, the HERS Raider industry. All these folks um, have been involved with combustion safety standards and protocols for testing and so forth. But we have seen very little of this in the light commercial, small commercial world. I guess I should define small commercial um, in the, the Advanced Commercial Building Initiative grant, which we have been studying small commercial buildings over the last about three years now, um, coming uh, kind of winding down this grant, this is one of the deliverables, we uh, would define small commercial as under 50,000 square feet. And that represents 95% like of all commercial buildings. Um, even if you drop that number to 25,000 square foot, that's still something like two-thirds of all commercial buildings hit that category. So small commercial is kind of its own animal. In many ways, it's more like a big house than it is a small industrial facility. <laughs> so it, it just kind of depends. But there's a lot more wrinkles and a lot more things to it. But we're hoping that more people will get involved in this, quite frankly, neglected building sector. Mm -hmm. And every building is different. Um, we're going to talk about some case studies um, later on um, that you know shows you some of the things that you know we actually found in in some small commercial buildings. Um, and you know this, using the concepts in this guideline, you know hopefully it'll it'll help um, you know building operators and managers and assessors have a, a better understanding that they can apply to their specific building. Um, and and you know just to kind of get this out of the way, the main safety issue here is um, the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning. And there's several different statistics out there, but every year some number of people die and a, and a larger number of people are poisoned accidentally by CO. And um, some of this is due to combustion appliances for sure. Uh, the, the issue is the, combine, the, the combustion appliance burns a fuel, let's say natural gas, and the products of combustion um, are not taken out. Um, or maybe it's incomplete combustion and the products of combustion are not taken out of the space and they get into the breathing air of the occupants. Um, and, and there are testing protocols that we have for homes and we'll touch on those. And we've developed some tools to help uh, you, the user, um, if you want to do testing. Um, because, but there's not really, a, there is no protocol for light commercial buildings. So we've kind of, um, pulled from several residential protocols, and, and we'll talk about that towards the end. Um, I would say a lot of this discussion today is about context. It's, not, it, it's, it's more than just being able to look at and identify what that appliance is, but also is it relatively safe where it is, or is it a risk of, for example, backdrafting because of the way it's installed? So the context of how an appliance is installed, I think, is a huge part of this. Um, I think that's probably enough to be said for at this point. Um, Any more? Um, and one thing I'll just mention while you know we're here on the executive summary, just talking you know the big picture. Um, you know, they mentioned the number of people Americans die each year, um, and this is where where it's tricky because a lot of a lot of um, you know what I have to say this is anecdotal information simply because there's not good data that is easily accessible. Um, to talk about how many people in America each year suffer from low-level CO exposure. Um, that's not something that you could just Google and just see a statistic that's been you know, kept. Right. Um, so, you know, some of the things that we're going to be saying come from our personal experience and also from the personal experience of contractors and installers and building operators and managers that, that we work with. Um, so, you know, to, to keep that in context as, as well. And like I said, hopefully, you know, as, as more and more uh, time and attention is devoted towards, you know, combustion safety, especially in commercial buildings, um, over time we will gather more data and be able to, you know, have empirical evidence to back it up. Um, but, you know, we're talking from our personal experience um, as well as, you know, experience we hear from, from you know, other folks out in the field. Um, I, good point. Um, I'm going to kind of dive in and say, um, you know, it's very likely if you're doing any kind of a light commercial building assessment that you'll at some point encounter combustion equipment. And um, another big thing is that often we're there, we're going to recommend some form of an envelope improvement on this light commercial building. And that's where things get really uh, a little 
scary, if you will, or, or just we've got to be more careful. So we want to make sure that we identify what the combustion appliances are, the context in which they're installed, and then make recommendations to make them very safe so then we can air seal the heck out of that building and insulate it and, and make it sort of a winner all around. Um, and, and, and I, I, am, I definitely see the value of combustion uh, safety testing. You know, Steve, you and I have taught a number of classes on how to do this. But I also think you have to appreciate its limitations. I, to me, it's a snapshot on that day of how that building performed. And, you know, things could change. The weather could be different. The building down the road, things could change in the building. Uh, how people use the building, what, you know, what gets covered up, what gets blocked off, those kind of things. So I, I'm looking for solutions that are you know, pretty robust. Um, and then finally, uh, the, uh, I guess I'm going to say at the end of this document, there's a number of resources that that you can that you can uh, reference for more information. So that's an appendix A. Mm -hmm. All right. And and I will add too that you know as as we go on, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail. But um, you know, for coming at it from approach of an approving existing building, like like Mike mentioned, often this includes envelope improvements um, that you know can include you know air sealing the building envelope and and duct sealing. Um, and, you know, we'll go into this in more detail as we talk, too, but um, leaky buildings could have combustion appliances in them that are working in, in a way that's not endangering the occupants. Um, but when we start altering the building envelope, and, um, you know, particularly with, with air sealing, we um, can change the way that the entire system performs. And a um, system that was safe um, before air sealing um, the air sealing could create a potential hazard. Um, so this is something we want to be real concerned about. And we're going to be taking what we consider to be almost the fail-safe best practice approach of how we view this with the overall idea thinking that eventually we're, our goal is to end up with a very tight building. Yeah. Um, so that will come into play later when we talk about um, combustion air and that type of thing. Um, you know, our mindset is, is you know, pretty much based around how would we treat a very tight building. So, so I want to throw a definition out here that some of you may have heard of this. It's called backdrafting. And basically, in, in my own layman's term, I'll say it's when the flue gases of whatever you are burning don't go up and out of the building the way they're supposed to. And when they, usually this is caused by, you know, negative pressure, when they're pulled back into the building and into the occupied space, um, that's called backdrafting. And backdrafting, interestingly enough, does not always produce carbon monoxide, but it usually does. And, and the carbon monoxide, of course, is the colorless, odorless gas that we can't see or taste or smell, but it poisons us. Um, it, it readily sticks to our, is our red blood cells. I always love this part. Yeah. And instead of, instead of an oxygen molecule, and it essentially carbon monoxide poisons you because oxygen does not get to your brain. Um, so it's a serious issue. It's something we want to pay attention to. Um, I've been involved in buildings now for well, over 20 years, and I have assessed thousands of buildings. And I've come to the conclusion that you can simplify things down to just basically two rules. And, you know, this may not be everybody's opinion, but in my experience, in my opinion, if we follow two rules, we'll set up a pretty safe situation and then uh, something that's going to hold up over time. So my rules are, number one, Provide combustion air for the appliance that is not the same air as the people in the building breathe. And so I want combustion air to be going through that appliance. I don't want it to be shared with my air. And the second thing, and this really I think makes sense, is whenever you burn something, you want to make sure that what you burn goes out and leaves the building. So we want to make sure it has a flue pipe that vents to the outside. You good with that, Steve? Yep, and <laughs> just, just to be clear too, you know, in order for there to be a, a carbon monoxide problem, number one, the, you're going to have to, the, something's going to have to cause the machine to produce high levels of carbon monoxide. Um, and then number two, that carbon monoxide is going to have to get back into the living space, not properly be exhausted. Yep. So there's really two things going on. One is, you know, is, is the machine making the poisonous gas? And number two is that poisonous gas able to actually get to the people. And if you follow these two rules, that 
greatly, greatly minimizes the chance of either one of those things happening. Yeah, I think I think that's about as simple as we could ever get it. Um, and and there are other issues with breathing, you know, with uh, combustion products that that we necessarily um, some are not as immediately hazardous, but could cause problems. Um, you know, nitrous oxides and sulfur oxides, and um, those are ingredients in smog and and acid rain, and those are not good for our lungs. Um, there's certainly particulates like soot and things like that, and and really in its own way, moisture is is a contaminant in its own way um, because it 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 uh, can cause so many other kinds of problems, um, condensation and and mold uh, uh, mold growth and things like that. So um, there and there are other issues as well. So really, want to I think go back to those two rules. So I'm going to say them one more time: separate air for combustion and a dedicated flue pipe. And, and we're, we're going to come back to that as we go deeper. All right, I, I promise we're going to see pictures in just a second. We thought we'd hit on some of the more common things you might experience in a commercial uh, assessment. Um, furnaces and water heaters, boilers, ovens, cooktops, and then you may run into things like gas logs or room space heaters, clo gas clothes dryers, uh, gas generators, um, cooking uh, of, like a grill, um, sometimes other kinds of process heaters or a fleet vehicle. Anything that can produce carbon monoxide, we kind of want to be aware of it. So we're going to start off with furnaces. And I'm going to put a picture up, Steve, and let you kind of talk about the three flavors of the furnaces. This is flavor number one here. Okay. So this is, um, and you can see this both in small commercial and, and in residential. Um, this is a, a older um, 60 to 70 percent efficiency furnace um, that's atmospherically vented. And um, these types of furnace, they don't have um, any type of mechanical assist um, for um, exhausting the flue gases. Basically, it relies on the stack effect, the fact that um, the hot gas will rise um, for, the, um, for it to be exhausted out of, out of the building. Um, typically, these, these machines don't have any kind of electronic ignition. They have a pilot light. And they have um, what's called a draft diverter, or some people call it a scoop. Um, and then, Mike, I don't know if you want yes. to just move your mouse over yeah. that. That's where um, it's back there. And it's open to the um, to the space around it because it actually does draw in the air from the space around it. Um, behind that, um, there's the end of the heat exchanger where the the um, termination, the gases come out and they get dumped up into there and rise up. Um, that's what's supposed to happen. Um, typically, they have a, a metal flue pipe, um, and these can be relatively easy to backdraft. They're basically just relying on the, the you know the principles of the the hot gases um, going to rise. If you create um, uh, enough of a negative pressure in the space around it, um, it'll overcome the stack effect and, and draw the exhaust gases in, into the you know the occupied space. Not necessarily a whole lot of combustion uh, of negative pressure to backdraft on these. Um, the other thing I just wanted to point out while we're on this is that this um, shows where the room air, the air around it, is being used um, as its combustion. The burners are inside of here, so the burners are inside of here. It burns, it combusts, goes out. Uh, through the heat exchanger, and then the products of combustion go up the draft diverter and out. So that's your old school furnace. I think those went away in 1992. I'm pretty sure is when that I looked that up. Um, and then that the next step of a furnace, I'll let you describe that, Steve, is what I call an 80% furnace. Yeah, and these are becoming more, you know, you know definitely more common, especially as time goes on. Um, you know, as, as the, the, the older 60 70 percent furnaces are being replaced, uh, quite often they're replaced with 80 percent furnaces. Um, these are different because they do have a mechanical um, assist that helps draw the gases um, from the burners through the heat exchanger, um, but it still does rely on the stack effect to, to actually um, have the gases exit the building. Um, if you look on the, the right-hand picture there, um, and Mike's kind of hovering over the the um, the, the um, mechanical assist there, um, a little a small fan that that helps draw the flue gases up. But then once it reaches the base of the flue, the gases basically um, you know rise up via the stack effect. Um, so this is a bit harder to backdraft than the than the um, 60 to 70 percent furnaces. But you know it still could be possible. Um, you know it's it, to create enough of a negative pressure to overcome the stack effect. Um, another uh, few notable, um, aside from that, that um, uh, draft inducer there, a uh, few other notice, notable uh, features. Um, these typically have an electronic ignition. There's no pilot light. Um, 
and they um, will have. A, they also have a metal flue. Um, quite often, these have a, a double wall type B flue on them, but not always. Um, and also, they typically rely on getting their combustion air from the space around them. Um, you know, in this photograph here, the the cover's been removed, but um, typically there's a louvered cover um, that would allow the um, you know the oxygen needed for combustion to get to the burners, um, kind of where Mike's uh, mouth is, the, the, the burners right there, um, and that's where they get their combustion air from. Right. So harder to backdraft, but still possible. Um, uh, and uh, again, uses the room air around it, and, and commonly, this is the standard furnace today, right? This is pretty much the most common furnace we see, um, or, or you know, it depends on. And I think in colder states, they the standard furnace today is a high efficiency furnace, but that that's a pretty common one for around here. Um, and then the next step up, we would call it a condensing furnace or a 90 plus efficient furnace. Um, that the technology of the combustion has changed, so we, we have to go to a different type of flue pipe. Mm -hmm. And these are interesting because they're uh, because they are such a um, have such high efficiency. They um, actually remove um, a lot of heat, and the the flue gas you end up with is not nearly as as hot as you would get from an eighty percent or a sixty or seventy percent um, furnace. So the, um, as the flu, the flu gas, um, the moisture in it can actually, if the temperature is low enough, the moisture in the flue gases can actually condense out of, um, and that's why these aren't vented with a metal pipe, um, because it would corrode, um, and they're typically vented with a PVC flue. Um, you know, it can, um, the, the gas isn't that hot, and it, you know, can, it has actually moisture condensing that's then drained um, from, from the system being a condensate line. Right. Um, these don't rely on the stack effect. If they did, that could be a problem because the flue gas isn't hot um, and it doesn't necessarily want to rise up as much. Um, so they have a um, actually the, a fan that um, helps exhaust the flue gases. And it's really pushing it out. It's mm -hmm. actually exhausting it out. It's not just letting warm air take it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's fairly common to see these things vented um, directly out of the sidewall. Um, in the photographs here, you can see the flue is one of those white pipes um, you know, running up, but um, there you go. Um, but you, know, you might just as easily see this installed where it, you know, makes a 90 degree bend to the left and goes right out the uh, exterior wall there. Yep. And then also, they um, have the ability to be configured, as we see it in this left photo, with a second PVC pipe that brings combustion air in. So it really is a sealed combustion direct vent scenario. Um, sometimes you see them installed like in this picture where there's just the flu and they left it open. So it's still pulling air, it just happens to be pulling air from, in this case, the space around it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we would generally prefer to see the left side um, if that's indeed what, uh, if that's indeed inside the living space. You know, if it's in, if it's in a, a vented attic or something, then the one on the right would probably be okay. But the one here, if it's in your, your commercial building, this is um, what we'd much prefer to see. We call that the two pipe versus the one pipe. And if you notice, there's no louvers or vents on the cabinet itself, um, you know, to allow combustion air in. It comes in through the, you know, the, the intake, as Mike just showed you. Um, very efficient, very safe. We know combustion air, how it's being handled. Uh, you can get these things in excess of 95% efficiency. And that's a really viable uh, a way to save some energy. Um, to jump from a 80% uh, up to a 90% is a 95% is a 15% savings right there. And if they're installed correctly using the you know the two pipe you know with the air intake, um, they're extremely difficult to to, to backtrack. Pretty pretty much impossible. So jumping onto water heaters, what you find is uh, kind of the same sort of flavors. There's a standard gas water heater. And Steve, that's one on the left. Can you, the, the, if you look at the one on the left, it, it looks like it's maybe installed in a garage on a platform. That's a code requirement, 80%. Um, and uh, it's just an atmospheric vented gas water heater. Can I add anything to that? Where's the air for combustion yeah. come from? It's coming from, from the space around it. Um, and this is a useful thing for, uh, to, to check for different machines have different strategies, um, 
and looking at the picture on this one, it's a little bit difficult for me to see. Um, they might have um, perforated vents on the side um, down there by the burners. There might be um, yeah, beneath, the, the, beneath the, okay, yeah, that's what that's showing. Um, yeah. That's where it gets this combustion air. Other ones might not have it there, but they might have a, a vent located at the very bottom of the unit. Right. Um, but um, from an assessment point of view, it's, it's important to note that, um, especially if we, the space is being used, um, that the occupants aren't um, storing things next to it or stacking things against it, that type of thing. Right. And this one has the draft diverter here at the top, and it, drafts, it, it seems, you know, drafts up. And this is a pretty standard atmospheric gas tank water heater. Um, and uh, I don't see a drip leg. I know it's not. Um, uh, we'll talk about that later. This is um, this is one that if it's in a garage, it's probably not a big risk. But if it's inside the building, um, sharing combustion air, it could pretty easily be backdrafted. This is the one on the right. It's basically the same exact water heater. It's a bigger unit, and it's in a commercial building, obviously. But its process of combustion is exactly the same. It has a burner at the bottom, uses air around it to burn with. It, it, the flue gases go up the central flue and then through a draft diverter and up and out. Sorry, I lost my picture there. The, um, this has two things that you sometimes see on a commercial water heater. One is it, it, to save some energy, it got rid of the pilot. So it has electronic ignition and there's a little sparker at the bottom. And also, there's a motorized damper that you see here at the top, and that is simply designed so that whenever the unit fires, the motor turns and opens the damper, and then the igniter fires and the gas burner, the gas valve opens and the burners fire, et cetera, et cetera. Flue gases go up. When the thing stops firing, the motor closes the damper. And what do you think that's there for, Steve? Yeah, for energy savings. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, and it, it, an open uh, an open flue pipe is essentially a, a hole in the building, um, or a hole in this case a hole in the tank of hot water. Yeah, that the the heat of the hot water can escape out of. So just a way to improve the efficiency of the of the of the water here. So um, that was um, that was a standard tank water heater. There's also a thing called a direct vent water heater. Can you explain what this is? Yeah, these are. Um, um, Similar to the, well, it, it depends, and let's see which of these ones. These can either be sealed combustion or not. Um, the, the, these, these are just standard. These are just standard direct Sealed combustion direct, I mean, they're just direct vent. Yeah, yeah. So they're, yeah. So they're concentrically okay. piped. Yeah, okay. So basically these are, these are similar to the, to the um, sealed combustion furnace in that they get their um, combustion air directly from the outside, um, and they exhaust their flue gases to the outside. Um, and oftentimes, one of the ways they do these this venting is what's called a concentric vent. And if you see the, the picture on the right there, um, you'll just see the, the vent just basically going out through the sidewall there. Um, but actually, that is um, um, pipe uh, inside a pipe. pipe inside a pipe. Yeah. And the, um, basically, there's the, the flue is running through the center of that larger pipe. And that's how it gets the combustion gases out. Uh, meanwhile, around the um, perimeter of that, or you know, within the, the larger pipe, um, it's drawing its combustion air in, and it's going down um, on the. You can see the the one on the left, um, that little bump on the back of the unit there. Yeah. Um, you know, the one on the right has that. You just can't see it in the picture, and that's where you know the pathway from the combustion air gets down to the burners at the bottom of the tank. So it's basically, it really is just an atmospheric. Uh, gas water heater. It's just that it's got it's got its own combustion air and exhaust provisions handled. So it does not use the air around it to burn with, and it is pretty safe. It's pretty hard to backdraft one of these. There's also a thing called a power vented uh, gas tank water heater. I think the basics here are it's got electronic ignition, no pilot. It's got a uh, a, a fan that is essentially sucking the flue gases through. And it has a little safety pressure switch such that if it doesn't detect that it's really working right, it won't fire. Um, and it's very hard to backdraft one of these, even though it does technically use the air around it for combustion. We don't see there's a whole lot down here in the south, but in other areas they're more common. And then there's basically the sister of the 
95% gas furnace, which is a sealed combustion direct vent, um, two pipe, two PVC pipe, uh, tank water heater. Mm -hmm. And these are very efficient and uh, very safe. And I, I have never seen one of these in a house. I've seen them many times in commercial buildings, particularly if there's a lot of hot water need, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a, a kitchen application or a, a, I think that one on the left is from a fire station. So, you know, much more much more common in that scenario. Anything you want to add on that? No, and just that, you know, basically in small commercial buildings, all of these are, are fair game. Um, and it depends on, you know, what what the building actually is and is being used for. And as we'll see in some of the case studies later, um, you know, change in equipment might make sense for um, a building. Part of the assessment would be to assess the hot water needs of the um, occupants of the building. Um, you know, it wouldn't make much sense for a small commercial building that basically just uses hot water for hand washing. Um, you know, the upgrade to this type of system might not be the most cost effective for them. Yep. Okay, so um, uh, and we, we can't not mention tankless, which kind of comes in the same two flavors. Ones that use the air around it to burn with and are more or less 80% efficient or the condensing variety um, that usually are um, in this case, uh, this is probably concentrically vented. So you, you, you can't just look at the pipe and say, oh, it's, it's, it's using the air around it to burn with. It may actually be a concentric vent like you see in this picture over here. Mm -hmm. So um, the only real difference is, so, so again, there's kind of two flavors of burners today, sort of the standard non-condensing and then, of course, the condensing. Um, when you jump to boilers, and I don't claim to be an expert on boilers. You probably don't either, Steve. But you know, they, they're going to make hot water. Um, some people think they make steam, and that's a very specific type of boiler, but they're going to make hot water that's usually used for some kind of space heating or other purpose, not for just um, domestic water. Um, and they, can, they come in either the 80% version standard or the high efficiency version. Um, the high efficiency version, I think you can see it on the, on the uh, Oh, no, I'm sorry, these are standard efficiency. So we also want to talk about um, some examples of unvented appliances we see in commercial buildings, particularly, uh, you know, ovens and cooktops. Um, gas uh, appliances in a commercial kitchen make a lot of sense. Uh, what do we want to see? Well, from an audit standpoint, if you go and you ever see one of these six burner gas ranges and it's got pilot lights, uh, it's burning gas all the time, and you can't even stand by it. It's so hot. It gets so hot. So we really want to um, look at the opportunity to uh, to, to go with a, a hot surface igni or a, a spark igniter. Um, and then, of course, with a even if we have a cooktop and we're burning gas, um, it's using the air around it for combustion. And where is the flu? Yeah. Basically, you know the. The, the byproducts are going directly into the space around them. You know, the, the flu might be someone's face. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but that, that's important to remember with these, these unvented appliances is they're, they're um, getting their combustion air from the space around them, but they're ex actually also exhausting to the space around them. Um, so, so it sure makes sense whenever you use a, a, a gas uh, heat cooking appliance that you have installed you install what over the top of it? Yeah, a range hood that's exhausted to the outside, that vents to the outside, or you know, exhaust system that vents to the outside. And I 100% agree. And our document um, has some resources and references to some really good resources on how to do uh, makeup air. Um, and in general, the rules on commercial kitchens are, you know, the the cooktop area you want that to be the most negative pressure. Usually, you want the kitchen to be a lower pressure than the rest of the building. Um, so any kitchen odors sort of stay in the kitchen. And then, of course, the main building, usually we want that to be positive pressure. So in this case, we're going to exhaust um, through our hood to the outside, like you said, and we probably need some makeup air as well. Um, and I mentioned, too, we, we mentioned the, the burners, but the same is true for the, the gas oven. Um, you know, yeah. it exhausts into the space right around it as well. And they can definitely produce some CO when they get old and dirty over time. We've seen that a lot. So here is an example of uh, something we don't want, which is a um, gas cooktop with um, what, what's above it, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> That's what um, some would call a, a, a vent or a hood, but it actually um, doesn't exhaust to the outside. Um, it simply just 
blows um, the the air and the byproducts directly back into the into the the kitchen space there. So, so that's not really helping us get the products to combustion out. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about you know venting um, ovens and range tops and you know that type of thing, you know it's it's got to be exhausted, vented to the outside, not 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 in, but right back into the kitchen. There's a whole big chapter in the International Mechanical Code that talks about exhaust systems and. They actually require makeup air um, if you're over 400 CFM, but we would argue that, you know, as you get in tighter buildings, you really need to be thinking about makeup air um, as well as you said, um, uh, make sure that it's ducted to the outside. And then there's some appliances that we think really just don't belong in a, in a certainly in a tight building, and those would be other unvented appliances. I'm not showing a picture of it, but a, an unvented space heater is one that you know, violates both rules of combustion. It uses the air around it and just exhausts its combustion products right back into the space. And, you know, um, some manufacturers make these, they call them decorative gas appliances, but they're still burning with the air around them and exhausting the food products back in the space. Most anybody with some sort of building science experience would, would agree that that's not a good idea from an air quality standpoint. All right. so. Another topic that we are probably going to run, you potentially run into any kind of a high bay application is uh, they want to heat that, heat that warehouse, heat that truck bay, heat that you know fireplace or, or uh, fire station bay. Um, there, there's kind of two ways of doing it. One is a hanging unit like you see here, and it's basically just an unvented appliance heating the air in that warehouse. Um, the problem is warehouses are pretty big in volume, and you're heating. You're talking about heating a lot of volume of air. The other approach is probably more efficient, which is a radiant heater. And the example, the advantage of the radiant heater is it's sort of a glowing red hot surface. If you're underneath that surface, you're nice and toasty warm, but you're not trying to heat all the air in this entire you know storage warehouse. So, um, you know, sometimes that's a good recommendation on an upgrade. We also see uh, generators, backup generators. This was another example of a big diesel generator, and there's the. It's inside those doors. They're louvered. There's the the exhaust manifold coming out. And guess what this is over here, Steve? Mm -hmm. uh, I will hazard a guess that that might be a um, uh, combustion air intake. No, no, not a combustion air intake. It's ventilation air intake. It's a ventilation <laughs> air intake. There we go. And we really don't like that to be this close, it's hard to say the exact distance, but I'd say that's probably less than six feet away. So we've got our, you know, products of combustion right here and our fresh air right here. I'll use the word fresh, so probably not that good, yeah. Um, so we, you know, that, that's a design issue. We'd certainly like to see those be a little further separated. One other thing worth mentioning too, Mike, is, um, oh, yeah. You know the importance of, of air sealing the space where the generator is at from the rest of the building. Hugely, uh, thank you. Yeah, and you know it's not uncommon to find out that you know when you get into the mechanical room or wherever the generator is at, that there might be significant connection between that and the occupied space. That is a very good point. And yeah, we don't want to have a provide a leak path for what is supposed to essentially be outside the thermal envelope. Very good, um, Steve. I've heard this thing called a CO detector and a CO alarm and a CO monitor. And uh, can you help me on those? You know, what what does it mean? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, typically CO detectors are um, typically won't trip unless there's um, uh, a very life-threatening situation going on, like which, a higher level, a higher of level, CO, higher CO. parts per million. Yeah. Which is which is great and wonderful, and you know it's very useful to have, um, but something like a CO monitor um, can provide a higher degree of safety um, because they're a little bit more sensitive and they'll alarm at lower rates, um, you know, down to less than 10 parts per million. Um, yeah. And especially if there's an area, um, a, a building like a, a daycare center um, where, you know, young children are there or if it's a place where, you know, um, a nursing home, maybe. A nursing home um, you know, people would be more susceptible to, um, you know, carbon monoxide poisoning, like, you know, uh, uh, you know, very young or, 
or um, older folks or um, people with um, you know compromised immune systems or pregnant you know, women I think is yeah. another example yeah um, those are good candidates for um, installing a CO monitor um, you know not only do they have alarms but also typically if you look in the photo the one there on on the left if, if, yeah, and the one on the right too um, typically they have displays that display the, the parts per million of, of CO um, and that's always useful information for the occupants to have, um, you know, as opposed to just whether or not an alarm is triggering to be able to see, you know, what exactly is the concentration of CO. And, it, and it's kind of ironic that the ones that are not that sensitive um, are UL listed. They're UL 2034 listed. But, but if they did, they're actually not allowed to display or to alarm at lower CO levels. You know, so it, it, it's very frustrating that that's the standard that we have. And, and it turns out things that are not UL listed are actually better or I think, you know, they're more sensitive and more likely to catch low-level CO. Um, I, I think that, that is, I, I def, this is what I have in my house, let's put it that way. Um, and I think they're good ideas. So the, the, at the very least, put a CO detector, which is the CO monitors are more expensive usually. Mm -hmm. But they um, will tell you a lot more, and they'll they can have a display and and show parts per million. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? I'll also, do is uh, you hear some debate about um, uh, where to put um, yeah. these at in the building? Should it be on the ceiling? Should it be low in the building? Um, basically, this, the carbon monoxide is roughly the same molecular weight as air. Um, it doesn't float or sink. It just disperses, um, you know, throughout. Um, you know, the, the volume of air. Um, so, you know, there is no set, you know, it needs to be in the ceiling or needs to be close to the, the floor. Yeah. Um, but just follow the manufacturer guidelines um, on where to locate the unit. And the other question I get is, um, you know, the CO monitors, a lot of times they're actually battery driven and it's a battery you can't change, which is interesting. Um, it'll last for many years and the reason is they don't want you to change it because um, about after the time the battery is gone, uh, so is the sensor. So there, there, you know, it's a, it's 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 the price you pay for for better monitoring. Mm -hmm. But it's what I put in my house. And whatever you know, um, an auditor would recommend, or you know, if, uh, if someone buying it for their own building, um, you know, it's important to uh, to research the individual product, read the manual, understand you know what it is or is not capable of, and and how to use it. Um, there's, there's lots of different flavors and lots of different types out there. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about what the code says you can do for combustion air in terms of supplying it. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this has a little bit of my opinion in it. I'm okay with that. Um, and uh, not everyone necessarily agrees with me, but I, I think there are aspects of the code that are maybe a little bit antiquated and assumed leakier buildings. Um, and today, that to me is not a safe assumption. And so, um, but the code also has some really good ways of, of, uh, of providing combustion air and we're going to certainly um, recommend that you choose those routes. So um, basically the real question boils down to, Steve, are you going to get your combustion air from the outside or are you going to get your combustion air from the living space? And, and, you know, share the air with the occupants or get it from, you know, independently. And so those are kind of the big, the big decision you have to make. So um, our toolkit uh, helps you assess if it is coming from the existing space, is it adequate? Um, in other words, would it meet code? But then our recommendation is going to be, you know, make an adjustment, make an improvement to, um, to correct that in my opinion. Um, so I think, uh, I think this is something that you have to make a decision about. But if we, if we do not get, this picture is showing the way I would not recommend it, which is getting combustion air um, through an opening that's high and an opening that's low, that's connecting it to where the people are. Uh, and if we change that and upgrade that or upgrade the appliances, then we can air seal the building all we want and make this a very efficient um, uh, building. So. Um, the code allows this. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, you have to make a choice, uh, um, and you know issues like, you know, is there a clothes dryer located right next to this that creates a negative pressure, and so on. So th those are those are concerns I have. Mm -hmm. um, 
One way of sort of fixing this problem, we've seen some examples of this already, is what we call a combustion closet around the appliance. And um, it can work, I think, with something like a water heater, but uh, not so great with a furnace. So here's a, here's a picture on the left. And can you describe what we're looking at on the left, Steve? Yeah, so there's a water heater in, the, in a small uh, closet here. Um, and the machine itself gets combustion air from the space around it. Um, it's in the, the, um, the picture on the left is kind of the before picture. Um, it's located in the closet, but it has a louver door, so it's actually drawing its combustion air from, you know, the, the space around it, you know, the, the rest of the building as well. Um, but also, you know, it's, it's, it's connected to the occupied space. Um, so negative pressures could backdraft and draw the gases through that louver door into the occupied space. Um, and it's, you know, competing with the people for combustion air. And like Mike was saying, if, especially if we tighten the building up, um, we might not, the machine might not be getting the combustion air that it needs from the inside. Um, so the a safe retrofit approach would be to um, convert this to a combustion closet where the machine gets its air from the combustion air from the outside, um, and then you know the entire closet is, is virtually disconnected from the rest of the building. We're going to um, carefully air seal the closet and isolate the appliance, and then bring the appliance its, its own air from somewhere outside. Exactly. Yeah, a little bit more concise than, than I was. I think about. you're doing fine. <laughs> but um, and this one uses the high-low um, venting, and the diagram, if you can see, there's actually. Um, uh, two, two um, um, high-low vents, um, and the high one terminates within 12 inches of the ceiling of the closet, and the low terminates within 12 inches of the floor. Um, and basically both of those are, you know, uh, the function of them is to, to draw combustion air from either directly from the outside or maybe from a, um, another space that's connected to the outside, like a vented attic above. Um, they could terminate in, in there if there's enough attic, you know, ventilation. Yep. Um, and like Mike said, you know, we replace the louver door with a solid weather strip door, air seal around all the other penetrations, literally isolate that closet from, from the rest of the building. So I sometimes would say, you know, this kind of looks like a, whole, a house as an example, but if it's a vented attic space above it, it's almost like we could choose to move the water heater up into the vented attic, or in this case, we move the vented attic around the water heater. And that's just another way to think about it. I don't know if that helps you or not, but anyway. Um, and, and I think our recommendation should be to fix that. Um, so that allows us to go forward with, with envelope upgrades, especially if we're looking at things like spray foam retrofits, which I want to mention, we're going to come back and talk about that at the very end. Um, One quick thing about the, the combustion in the closet. Yeah. Mike mentioned this. It's easier to do with a water heater than a furnace. Um, oftentimes in practice, this can be a, a fairly difficult thing to do. Um, because of the location of the equipment, you might not be able to access everywhere you need to air seal, all that type of thing. So, you know, on paper, it might seem like a real attractive option, but in practice, it could, it could be challenging. Um, and sometimes um, it could actually be less cost effective than um, upgrading the equipment to a, you know, like a seal combustion, um, you know, appliance. Yeah, so if we upgrade the equipment to a high efficiency unit and it handles its own combustion air safely, then we also get the benefit of energy efficiency as well as a safer installation. So I 100% I, I agree with you on that. Um, jumping around, I'm just going to make a couple references. This is all spelled out in the mechanical code and um, the term high-low vents and it's my term, but they call it two permanent openings. And it's exactly what you described. Um, basically, if you have two, uh, excuse me, if you have uh, ducts that run vertically to a vented space, for example, or to the outside, then the rule is one square inch of cross-sectional opening per 4,000 BTUs. And if you go horizontally, it's, it's twice the size of cross-sectional area, or one, one square inch per 2,000 BTUs. And it's the sum of all the appliances in the space. So here are two examples that you can see. Um, the one on the left has got horizontal ducts that go through the building, let's say, and then pull from the outside and deliver that combustion air to the combustion closet. And the one on the right, it's got two high-low ducts that go vertically up into a vented attic space. And you know, there's a couple details about you want to make sure that these ducts extend way up above the insulation. I would personally recommend you always put a, 
um, a hardware cloth on it just to kind of keep large critters from being able to crawl down it. You know, but that is essentially allowing the air in the vented attic to work its way down so it can be used by the water heater to burn with. And like you mentioned, this closet is now sealed off from the rest of the building. One of the, just one of the disadvantages of the combustion closet too, um, you know, frequently in, in some of our case studies, you know, we'll make sure we get there to, to show you some real life example. But um, oftentimes the combustion equipment will be in a, a small room that's not just a closet, but it's being used for other things like laundry, um, or there might be utility sinks or something like that in there. And when you make a combustion closet, you essentially kind of lose that usable space from, from your, um, from, you know, from, from usable space. Um, in the winter time, you know, it could be cold. In the summertime, it could be hot. You know, essentially it's like now it's outside the building envelope. So it's not necessarily, um, you know, the best solution for all circumstances, especially if, you know, people are regularly accessing that space and using it. Yeah, and today, too, if it's an old furnace, for example, you know, uh, it's really hard to do a combustion closet around a furnace. But it's a good decision, I think, a lot of times to upgrade from an 80% to a 95. You're going to gain energy savings and you're going to gain safety. And I think this is a really good decision. Um, so here we've got... Um, so I started off, Steve, just writing up some case studies and scenarios of things I had encountered. And, um, and you know, after a while I kind of realized, uh, and I kept adding more, and I kept adding more, and I kept adding more. So, um, but, but I feel like I'm a person that learns by examples. And so just kind of different ways of, of assessing. Um, these are all, you know, a lot of buildings that we've looked at. So um, the first one that we're talking about is um, a, uh, a fairly new building, you know, that I'm going to say was like 10 years old maybe. And um, it originally had on the plans at least, because we had the plans, it had high-low vents. You know, it was a, a flat roof and it had high-low vents. And that's kind of what you're looking at right there. That was one of the intakes. And it ducted down to a closet where there was a gas water heater. And I don't know if it was the original gas water heater or if it had been uh, upgraded to a high efficiency gas water heater, but that's what, what they had when I encountered it. And that's what these two PVC pipes are. One is the combustion air brought in, the other is the exhaust flue gas is going out, and there is the water heater. And so the, the, from an audit standpoint, what we recognized that nobody else did was that, well, you basically have unnecessary high-low vents in this space. And I will tell you that, and we see this a lot too, that they don't really follow through a lot of times on the details of combustion closets, which involves air sealing the bottom of the door. And, and, and you know, so what happened is those high-low vents were, not, were absolutely not needed at all. There were an extra roof penetration, and that was another leak path for water. And all that, you know, in the wintertime, cold air gets into that closet, and because the door didn't have a good seal at the bottom, some of that unconditioned air basically worked its way in the building. So, you know, the simple fix is just to tape them over, but the better fix would be to remove this, this roof penetration. Mm -hmm. Make sense to you? Yeah, and I'll just add that, um, you know, things like this aren't uncommon, either due to retrofits, um, but also to, you know, just uh, installation errors or, you know, during the, the process, um, you know, the construction process. Um, and, you know, it's important to remember the, the building as a systems approach. Um, sometimes, you know, it might have been a, a plumber who recommended the upgrade to the, you know, to have the, the condensing fuel combustion um, water heater um, who wasn't necessarily, you know, involved with um, the, putting the vents in. Yeah. Um, you know, so from an auditor standpoint, you know, these are things to, to, to watch out for. Or, you know, like Mike said, it could be if it was an upgrade, um, then the, the plumber who upgraded it might not have, you know, been thinking about sealing off the, the high-low vent. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know. It could have been that the architect drew it and they made the provisions for a standard mm -hmm. atmospheric tank, and then at the last minute they upgraded it, and it was built this way from the beginning. But, the, but they could have removed those, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So. I guess the, the message is, is in construction or retrofit, sometimes wires get crossed and messages get confused. And as an assessor and auditor, these are the kinds of things that you're, that you're looking for, building their systems. Here's another good one. This was a preschool, and it had an older atmospheric 80-gallon standard you know, tank water heater. It's in a big 
pretty decent sized utility closet. It had uh, it had the uh, um, the louvers were fixed louvers in that closet, and um, and so you're like, okay, this is good. I mean, and and it was good from a safety standpoint, but um, let me go a little further down here. Here's the blueprints of it. You can see, so there was a door to that closet, and they had put a washer and a dryer in this space. They had um, the water heater over here and the louvers in the wall, but they also had supply conditioned air. So basically, Steve, they were pumping conditioned air into this space, and the window was open, and they did this all year long. So they're throwing away air conditioning in the summer, they're throwing away heat in the winter, and it was all because essentially they made their closet too big, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've got other pictures here. So there's the water heater, there's the louvers, and you know, I don't know, well, go ahead, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, this, this kind of goes yeah. back to what I was talking about earlier, and it's almost a situation where, you know, we can't decide, is this the function of this room a place to safely hold combustion equipment or is the function of this room to also be you know a laundry and and you know occupied space as well um, or to be a space that we have a window open all the time and then throw, yeah, yeah. throw duct conditioned air into that space you know so what you know basically what they end up with was you know this this large combustion air you know um, intake there you know it's like saying it's basically like an open window in that room um, that's good to you know give the machine combustion air from the outside, but at the same time, this room is you know being used as an occupied space and it's being supplied with conditioned air. Um, from an energy efficiency point, it just doesn't make sense. Also, like we were mentioning, typically rooms like this are often very well connected to the rest of the building, so having that wide open window results in comfort issues and um, condensation. In condensation. Um, and then you'll have occupants doing things like, um, you know, sealing up that yeah, open window, yeah. um, which we'll get well, to that later. That <laughs> later. Yeah. Oh, you're absolutely right. And so at the end of the day, you know, what we probably would recommend was go to something like a condensing uh, gas tank water heater or even a tankless water heater. Two-pipe system brings its own combustion air. And then here's the tricky part. You can't just recommend that equipment upgrade. You've also got to follow through with adjusting the envelope. And when I say adjusting the envelope, once that equipment has been upgraded, we want to close that window off. And most plumbers don't install windows. And we also want to get rid of the flip pipe that is from this old water heater that pokes through the, through the roof, and, and, and at least at the re-roof. And we want to block it off in the near term, and at re-roof, we want it removed. So just again, thinking of it as a system. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, we mentioned this, a hybrid approach, or I'm not sure we mentioned this, but we also don't like a hybrid approach, and this is one, what does that mean, Steve? Um, basically, you're getting, you know, part of your combustion air from the outdoors and part of it from, you know, the, the, in, the rest of the building. And, and we had a problem with this where um, this, this, was a, uh, this was a fixed louvers on the side of a building that was providing combustion air for two furnaces and a, and a water heater. And as you can imagine, these are holes to the outside. Well, where I'm standing when I took this picture was a door that had a bunch of louvers in it. So basically, you can imagine all of that hot, humid outside air basically came into the building, into the closet, and then into the building in the summer. And cold, drafty air came into the closet and into the building in the winter. And so that was a real problem. And the, the occupants were drafty. They didn't like it in the winter. So unfortunately, their solution was to block over the combustion air louvers because they didn't want to feel the draft, which meant now all the combustion air was coming from inside. So not a good solution. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it's too bad they didn't feel the other part. <laughs> all and right. you know, once again, these are things for an auditor to, to you know, look for. Yeah. So when you're in doing an assessment, we kind of reference several different documents and, and uh, make some suggestions of things to look for. And we're not going into every little detail here. But visual inspection uh, uh, can be something that's pretty, pretty quick and can actually tell you some useful information once you kind of learn a little bit about what you're looking for. Um, first thing we want to see is the gas lines. Or, or we want to kind of smell for gas. And, and do we smell it anywhere? But also we want to check the gas lines. Mm -hmm. What are we looking for? few things to look for, um, 
you know, big red flags. Um, see if there's um, the connections. Make sure they're not soldered. Um, they shouldn't be connected with, with solder. Um, sediment traps. Um, like you see um, what they call it, a drip leg in, the, in that picture there um, are a good thing to, to be looking for where the, the pipe um, hangs down below. Um, where that tends to collect uh, of sediment, sediment instead of having to go through the gas valve of the appliance. Exactly. Um, and the actual, um, it, on the picture on the left there where you see the word hard pointing to that, that's showing that there's um, hard pipe going through the um, hole in the cabinet. Um, if you have flexible gas line, um, especially if there's not any kind of rubber grommet there protecting it, just the unit vibrating to puncture the flexible line. Um, a couple kind of kind of sort of common sense type things that you're looking for, I guess. In yeah. Sense. And then and then the next question is you could use a, a leak detection solution and squirt it on the gas line, mainly on the fitting, to see if, if you're detecting a, a gas leak. And that's something that, you know, from a health standpoint, we can have that repaired, right? Mm -hmm. So. Or, you know, a, a gas leak detector is, you know, a useful tool for an auditor to have to you know, check for, for gas leaks with the detector. Um, we want to look at the draft diverter, which, and here's an example on a, on, a, on a water heater, and you can tell there's corrosion, there might be dust, um, there is, uh, you know, there's uh, evidence that, what happened, Steve? This is an evidence of, of spillage, um, you know, or, you know, backdrafting, but basically the combustion gases, um, instead of going up and out the flue pipe, um, are spilling into the space around them. And remember the combustion gases, they're, they're warm and moist and, and um, corrosive, um, and when they come out there, that moisture condenses on the surfaces around there, um, that corrodes things, and it also attracts dust. So this is a pretty um, big red flag if you see something that looks like this around a draft diverter or draft hood. That chances are it's not been venting properly, and, and it could be because there's not enough air for to, to, to be allowed to go up the flue pipe. It could be the clogged flue pipe. There are several reasons why this could be happening, but it's an indication something's wrong. Here's another corrosion picture. Um, you can also look at the burners themselves. You know, do they look dirty? Do they seem to have uh, you know debris on them, or or uh, you know uh, oh, cobwebs? <laughs> You know, um, you Just can pile the rust. Yeah, the top yeah. Do you see condensation? The the metal flue pipe does it slope upwards? This is a picture I took in a building. I, you have to believe me; these are real numbers. That it was um, one inch, and then it dropped to three inches, and it, it should be the other way around. It should always slope upwards um, as as the flue leaves the building. Um, otherwise, condensation can pool and really rust out the bottom. You can see a little bit of corrosion there. And, and I liked your, you made a comment earlier about how, or we were talking earlier about using a torpedo level. Yeah, as you get into cramped spaces and things like that, um, you know, don't let yourself be fooled. Um, you know, in this circumstance with the ceiling, it was pretty obvious to Mike that the ceiling was level. Um, but when you're crawling and, uh, and looking at things from a different angle, um, if you're trying to compare the slope of the flue pipe to a floor joist or something like that, it could very well be that the floor joist isn't level. Um, so it's useful to have, I recommend having a 12-inch a, a torpedo level because um, you're looking for a quarter-inch rise for every 12 inches of run. Yep. So if you level off a foot-long torpedo level um, against the flue, you'll be able to see if you have that, that quarter-inch distance between the level and the flue. And again, remember, it always slopes upward. Um, you can look at the flame itself when the burners fire. And what you're looking for is a blue flame. And if you see a lot of yellow-orange, that usually means something out of whack. Um, you can look and see, you know, like on a water heater, there's a thing called flame rollout where um, something, you know, like a big exhaust fan operated when this thing tries to fire and it, and it literally, the flame, instead of going up the middle flue pipe, rolls out and scorches the cabinet. Um, not real common, but I've definitely seen it. And then, uh, and then with furnaces, well, I'm sorry, go I just say a quick safety message here, you know, we're talking about observing <laughs> the burners, just watch them while they're firing. Um, you know, you don't know that that machine, whether or not it's going to shoot out a ball of fire when you turn it on, until you turn it on. Um, so when you're doing these, keep safety in mind, and um, you know, a lot of auditors, assessors, as we're in buildings, um, we're focused on what we're doing, but be really cautious. Don't put your face right in front of the, the burner compartment and then fire the appliance, because um, you might end up um, going home with no eyebrows. Is that, that is that how you got your unibrow? <laughs> yeah, I wondered about that. That's okay. how I got rid of my unibrow. Uh -huh, I got so, it. 
but common sense safety, you know, and don't get so caught up in, in, in what you're doing that, that you forget, you know, these types of things. Right. Also, flue pipes can be hot, um, you know, don't Point. lean against them or touch them, you know, um, keep that kind of thing in mind. And we, you know, rec these little belt CO detectors are pretty inexpensive. You can wear those and they'll, they'll let you know if the ambient CO around you gets uh, uh, too high. And, and a lot of times you'll hear 35 parts per million. I don't want to breathe 20 parts per million, but, but you'll probably live through that. Um, and again, take pictures. Uh, this is what uh, we found is if you take a lot of pictures and you document what you found, you can usually get somebody to help you if you're a little new to this and try to figure it out. Um, I, I, I feel like that's been really useful. I wanted to have a small section on fuel choice economics. And I'm just going to say um, it, uh, what your recommendations are a lot of times depends on what uh, your your you know energy rates are and how they're for electricity and commercial buildings you could have a flat per kWh rate or you could have a demand charge um, for gas kind of something similar sometimes you have a fairly low meter fee and a pretty high per therm rate and uh, sometimes it's the other way around so I've got a couple examples here talking about it and the the, the net implication is um, you know what are the economic impacts? Like, if I'm paying a high monthly meter fee, but a low price for therm, if I do something and I save 100 therms of gas, I'm going to save 50 bucks a year. So that that may that may not be the greatest. In other words, saving gas on that where the gas rate is really cheap doesn't do me much good. But if I'm paying, you know, a dollar twenty-five a therm and I save 100 therms, you know, that's a lot more dollar and the payback is faster on an, on an improvement. And likewise, it, it kind of says in this scenario, usually if you're going to have gas in your building and you're going to need a lot of heat, gas is the way to go compared to, say, electric resistance. Um, so, you know, you do a little analysis on this um, and check this out. But, you know, this I, I won't go into all the nitty-gritty detail, but, you know, I, I, switching to a gas clothes dryer did pay back pretty quickly in this uh, in this Atlanta example. It took a little longer, a two-year payback in this example. Um, and also, sometimes it makes sense to kind of uh, use gas for everything or don't use it at all. I mean, frankly, all electric buildings, they don't have to pay a meter fee. So if the meter fee is high and uh, you only have one gas-using appliance, you know, you could consider either getting rid of it or um, disconnecting the gas. Um, we had a project, it was a historic building we're going to look at in a second, um, where we got, we upgraded the furnaces, we conditioned the crawl space, we eliminated the gas water heater for point of use, and the only thing left was a gas oven stove that nobody used. And we said, look, they said, well, we might use it once or twice a year. We said, look, if you don't need it in the summer and you shut off your gas, um, you could save $140 a month. You'll have to pay a reconnect fee, but in the course of a year, you're talking about a $600 of savings, and that was a pretty small building. So there was actually more savings to do that than there was just from going to a high efficiency furnace. Um, and then sometimes you get a situation where we had an office building; it already had an, it had gas furnaces, but it had an electric water heater, and they used it maybe for washing hands or dishwasher. And in that case, it probably wasn't worth it to recommend replacing the electric water heater if it still functions. So you have to kind of factor some of this stuff into it. Um, any thoughts on propane? Or um, just that, you know, it can, can be expensive? <laughs> kind of all over the place yeah. is what I've experienced. Very volatile <laughs> in its price. Mm -hmm. Sometimes really not so bad. Other times electric resistance is definitely cheaper than propane. And you know, just to, you know, and, and the, the the guide we should mention. I don't I don't know if we mentioned this in the beginning, but the, the guide will be available soon um, to to the public. And as you know, folks, we're not going to get into all the details of this section here. But the, a big message is that um, you know you're going to be making recommendations that might involve upgrading equipment or possibly changing fuel type. Look at all the factors you can for that individual building and that individual customer. You know, what are they using these appliances for? Um, you know, what are the rates in that area? Um, and, you know, so you can help them make the most informed, you know, cost-effective and safe decision. Yeah, and I just put some, a couple examples here of, uh, you know, a gas rate. And if your rate is double that, 
you can double these numbers. If your rate is half that, you can half these numbers. So you can just proportionally adjust these numbers. And this is just for a fixed amount. I think it's want to say it's like it's not a lot, maybe 60 gallons of hot water a day. Um, and what what would it cost you? Um, and then and then based on different types of fuel and different types of efficiency, you can certainly get more efficient equipment than what I've listed here. Um, I have a comment about being cautious when you switch an older building. You know, this was an older building that at one time had been a residence converted to an office, and uh, it had uh, it had it at one point had a condensing gas furnace, one for the whole three-story building. It was probably undersized, and they came in and they got rid of a lot of the energy features on the building, and instead they put in a heat pump, and they were pretty unhappy with the results. And I'm like, that wasn't probably the best decision for an older, leaky, less efficient building. Um, here's another good one, Steve. This is a another commercial space we visited that had a uh, a, sec, a, a tenant space, and the guy's bills were 250 for October, November, 550 for November, December, going up pretty high, huh? 1750 for you know a 2,500 square foot tenant space. That was a pretty high power bill. We went and looked at it, and long story short, they had one air conditioner an electric furnace, which is why this was spiking up so high, and one air conditioner and gas furnace. The gas furnace quit operating because it was in a confined space. It did not have enough volume to burn it and was shutting off. And so, you know, we basically said uh, probably, you know, pretty definitely provide combustion air for the gas furnace so it doesn't shut off and also, um, uh, or you know, fix it, and also consider getting rid of the electric resistance heat. Go to a heat pump, or or to two gas furnaces. You know, so lots of lots of considerations there. Um, wanted to make a comment about. I think you mentioned this earlier about how, you know, we want we don't want to provide the owner with a list of possible improvements and say, you know, pick at your leisure from this list in any order you want. Uh, combustion safety to me needs to be top of the list. And then we can do, you know, things like air sealing um, as opposed to the other way around. So um, we kind of pull a little bit. I, I quoted some residential language here that just says these are not to be implemented independently. And if you mess with my list in a different order, you know, you caveat emptor. I think in a way. So um, we'll scroll on down. And uh, a couple more examples of. Some real-world scenarios we had. This was a fairly larger, a larger space um, that had uh, most of its mechanical equipment was either in a dedicated uh, combustion closet with proper high-low vents and everything done correctly. The rest of the equipment was in another closet that was basically in the attic, so it was getting combustion air. But they had this one big water heater that was right in the middle of the building or right in the middle of a space where they use louvers to get combustion air from the, from the building. And we really wanted to um, improve this envelope by foaming the roof line. We thought this would be a good candidate for that. And so we said, you either need to make a real combustion closet out of this, or better yet, they relocated it. And that solved the problem. So then we could move forward. Again, thinking about it holistically. Here's another building we went to where they had, uh, we see this a lot, Steve, um, a metal building with insulation at the roof line, and then for some reason someone has put a ridge vent and soffit vents in. What's the purpose of that? I think, yeah. Oh, and then, of course, yeah. back on top of the drop ceiling. Yeah. And it's just basically, you know, wires getting crossed and not using the system's approach and... Um, or just not you know, understanding. Yeah, just not, you know, the built concept of the building envelope is, you know, your thermal boundary and um, uh, pressure boundary, your, your air barrier and your insulation need to be in, uh, complete and they need to be, um, you know, in contact with each other. Never and, vent underneath your Yeah, insulation. and the, venting underneath your insulation essentially is just bypassing the insulation as the, you know, the outside air can travel, you know, past the insulation into the, the occupied space. So one of our recommendations was we were going to say, hey, let's let's fix this problem. Let's let's uh, make it a insulated roof line. And but we looked and there was a closet that had um, combustion air coming from three different places, basically from a vented attic, 
a little bit from the outside and also from the actual living space. And we said, you know what, you're going to have to, there's the three furnaces that were in it. We said, and you need to seal off this closet and provide high-low vent probably from the outside and, uh, and, and make that work. Um, here's another one we found that uh, <coughs> this was that historic building I mentioned earlier that was a, a base of 60% furnace with 95% furnace allowed us to encapsulate the crawl space safely and get rid of the water heater. Um, when we walked in though, this is what we found. The water heater they had was literally just sitting in the kitchen and someone's desk was right next to it. And I should mention there was a gas leak in there as well. It kind of smelled bad. So we said, you know, why do you need this gas water heater? The had is hand washing. So we went to a point of use electric and that's a picture of it right now. Basically really close to the fixture. So very, very, very almost no distribution losses. And um, we had found they make instantaneous ones that have you know no tank, but uh, tankless electric, but we don't really like those when you put an aerator on the fixture. When you put a low flow aerator on the fixture, you, you have to have enough flow those type in order to make any hot water. We found that if you put, you can pull water off of it at any rate and you'll get some hot water. So particularly for hand washing, this is a good upgrade. Yeah. And once again this is, you know, stress is the um knowing uh, what the building is being used for and what the occupants needs are. You know, a, a restaurant has very different hot water demands than, than an office space such as this. Yep. Um, you know, not one, there's not one solution, or not one size fits all, one solution for every small commercial building. Um, it's important to, you know, recognize that each um, and every one of these projects um, could, you know, use completely different strategies. You've got a chance to do some blower door testing on, in five straight days on five different sandwich shops in Metro Atlanta, five different ones. What was interesting was they all handled hot water differently. Some had gas atmospheric, some had gas condensing, some had all electric. It was kind of all over the place. Well, they had electric. And um, they were, their problem was the gas water heater wasn't working. And we checked, and what happened is the pilot light had been snuffed out. And um, you can see from the louver door, Steve, where is the combustion air coming from? From, from the kitchen. Yeah, from the kitchen. <laughs> and so, uh, again, building their systems, they turned on their kitchen hood, it backdrafted and snuffed out the pilot, and then they said it doesn't work. So all they had to do, ironically enough, was there was actually an already a penetration that was unused to seal that door off and make this a sealed off chamber and provide combustion air, and they could continue with their water heater. So another interesting little example. Um, this is a great one. This is a uh, this is a larger building that had pretty big combustion equipment in a mechanical closet with louver doors not very well maintained in this picture here. Um, and sadly, from an energy standpoint, this combustion closet was connected to the rest of the building via the um, plenum space. So what happened in these pictures, Steve? Can you describe what I'm seeing here? Yeah, and this is a, a fairly common thing, you know, when you have the, the drop ceiling with the, the water stains on there. Um, and oftentimes, you know, the users of the building might think that this is a plumbing leak. Or but a roof leak. Yeah, or a roof leak. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's a, the result of out, humid outside air um, coming in, you know, like through those louver doors, you know, and above the drop ceiling, you know, from the mechanical room. Um, and then if they strike a cold duct or any cold surface above that drop ceiling, um, the moisture from the outside air will, will condense um, and then, you know, drip down as liquid water. So this is exactly what we found right there, uh, intentional venting for combustion appliances, but that closet was not sealed off from the rest of the building and it became a huge infiltration path. Once again, building as a systems approach, you know, the people in the mechanical closet could very well have had a very thorough understanding of how much combustion air it needs and where to get it from, um, but they ne didn't necessarily, you know, um, understand the importance of that mechanical closet being air sealed from the rest of the building. And this yep. is a pretty common, um, you know, scenario. Um, and then lastly, I did want to mention this. If 
this is a common retrofit that we're seeing is this idea of um, you know spraying foam and, and turning a, a former vented attic into a, um, a non-vented assembly and that's great but you can't do that with an 80 percent furnace we don't want you to try to get I see you can't we don't want you to get combustion air from around this to burn with you can't effectively build a combustion closet around we'll invent it for combustion air because then you just violated the definition of unvented assembly. Um, so what you need to do is have the right kind of combustion, and then you can seal up the and make an unvented assembly. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that's kind of the the big completion. And there are some great references in here um, about hoods, and, and this is a really good article by Joe Stebrick about makeup air and uh, low level CO detectors and, and so on. Um, what we want to, dem to demo really quickly, and Alex is going to reduce this down, there's a good picture, um, is the, uh, the toolkit comes with a workbook, and we have one that's sort of got a, a fictitious scenario filled in. So I'm going to pull that one up just because it's got a few numbers. And Steve, we can kind of talk about this. It looks like it's already open, but I'll open it anyway. And um, it's a spreadsheet. It's editable. You can use it as a template and adjust accordingly, which is what we would encourage you to do. And I'm going to kind of walk through it. Now again, this is the, the sample one. So it has sort of made up answers on it. So, so I, under the overview, it, talks you, it talks, you what, talks you through what you do on each page and what you're going to assess. And then when you get into the, uh, the next page, it's filled in with a sample project. So I don't know if I can quite, I have to shrink this down just a hair. Um, so maybe drop this down a hair. And this worksheet's pretty useful because, um, you know, it performs a lot of the calculations for you. Um, and it also incorporates, um, you know, some guidelines if, if you were to do, an assessor was to do combustion safety testing. Um, you know, it, it has some, some information about, um, you know, t typical uh, uh, pressures that correspond with, you know, a lot of the standards that are out there, um, the, the BPI standards or um, ACA or, or even the DOE um, in their standard work specifications. Um, so, you know, different standards have different numbers, but this, this worksheet has some of those numbers integrated in it as well. Yeah, and, and you can decide if you want to follow somebody else's protocol. Like I said, there isn't one, as far as we could tell, for like commercial, small commercial. Here's an example problem. It describes, it shows you how you might fill in details. It puts the floor area and the conditions you encountered. It lists some of the equipment that you may need. The, the expensive piece of equipment is the combustion analyzer. Um, and if you have that, great. You can do a real combustion test. But even if you don't, if you have some of these others, these are pretty inexpensive tools. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of these, uh, even if, it, if nothing else, it helps guide you through what to do. So, let, and one right. thing, too, real quick, is a word of caution. You know, any auditor or an assessor who's starting to look at these things, know the limits of your, of your knowledge, um, and um, always be willing to defer to a, a qualified professional. Um, you know, and so an auditor, you, know, you don't necessarily need to go out and buy a combustion analyzer, but if you learn some of the red flags that you could refer to you know, a qualified um, you know, uh, HVAC professional or you know, plumbing um, for, for follow-up, for more detailed analysis, um, always keep that in mind. You know, right. Don't don't uh, don't overestimate your your, your knowledge or ability. I'm, I I I'd never do with you, but only yeah, with myself. Yeah. So, so with uh, you know, here's asking you about: Did you detect gas when you came in? Do you measure ambient CO levels? Um, is it acceptable or not? And then it's asking you some questions: What have you encountered? Have you encountered atmospherically vented combustion appliances? Um, and it asks you to describe the CAS over here. What did you find? What equipment is it? Um, take it through. List the appliances. Here's a, a water heater and a furnace. And here's the model number. Here's the total, uh, how many BTUs they are. 94,000 BTUs total. And so a quick calculation says you would need 4,700 cubic feet of uh, volume in this space. So if I change that to, let's say, let's change that to 44,000. You should see that number go up. So now I need I need more space to be considered unconfined. So you go to the next page, and that carries over for you. 
and it's asking you some questions. What's the total BTU? What's the required volume that's carried over? Then it asks you to assess where are you getting combustion air from, and you answer some questions. Is it coming from the space, or is it coming from the outside? And then what, here's some questions about the ducting, because it, you know, it, are the ducts following that rule, that rule space on the code? Um, and then as you, you can also assess the volume of the CAS and the volume of the assessed space. Um, I think I changed something on here to make it, now it's failing both times. So it'll tell you, is it combined or uncombined? And um, uh, if the CAS alone is connected, is confined, and combustion air is provided via connection with the indoor space, are both connections made within, okay, is that good? Yes. Is it big enough? Yes. Is there enough net free area? It looks like we made it. So we would say we, we have adequately supplied what the appliance needs as per code. So that's one thing, yes or no, does it at least meet code? And then you can decide, is that an acceptable installation? Here's other visual inspection stuff that we've covered, Steve, about looking at the gas lines and, and apply, uh, firing the appliance and making observations. The little kind of prompts for you to follow. Uh, then the third page is something called worst case depressurization. If you want to do this test, it's where you basically um, measure how bad can we make the pressure in the combustion appliance zone go just by turning everything exhausting on? And so in this example, we started at a minus 0.8 with everything off. We turned on some stuff, and we got it to minus 4.4. So the delta that we created was minus 3.6 pascals. And then we kind of have a, a little traffic light approach on this that just sort of tells you what's your kind of relative risk in this situation. Steve, you want to add anything on that? I would just say that, you know, these, these are some, some general numbers and they're based upon, um, you know, residential standards, um, you know, and, you know. Physics. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but, um, you know, you can look this up on, on different standards and they'll give you different specific numbers. But in, in general, this, this kind of traffic light approach on here um, you know, is, is, is um, um, consistent with, with, with uh, the other accepted standards out there, albeit residential standards. Yeah, if your CAS, combustion appliance zone, um, doesn't get pulled very negative or at negative at all when you turn on all exhaust devices in the building, then that's a pretty good sign. It says your CAS is, is isolated and you're hopefully getting combustion air from the outside. If you turn on a clothes dryer or some other exhaust device and it pulls it down to minus 12 pascals, well, that's very likely you're going to backdraft the gas water heater. So that, that's kind of, and also duct leakage can have a big impact. So there's some details about duct leakage. Um, and then there's steps about um, doing a spillage test, which is basically firing a cold appliance and seeing what happens. And, uh, and you can follow through on that. And then finally, if you want to do uh, combustion analysis, um, it talks you through the process of that. And today, most of the standards are using what's called an air-free CO limit. Um, so it's, it's a little more um, expensive combustion analyzer that's a little more sophisticated to do this, but there's some equations that you can, um, you know, sometimes you can back out the numbers. They, they generally do this for you. And so that's basically, um, you know, here's some details about this made up scenario. What, in essence, what did it tell me? What would I recommend based on this? So you can read this just as an example problem. And so Steve, uh, that is coming to the end of our presentation. Should we put our picture up one more time? <laughs> uh, what would you like to, to add on this? I would just like to say, you know, hopefully this, the guideline and, and the workbook will be useful for people to use as, as a resource, um, you know, to, to take a more comprehensive um, look at combustion safety in, in commercial buildings. Um, and also highlight the fact that every building is different, you know, especially, you know, when you talk about small commercial, um, could have, you know, different types of businesses with, you know, different types of systems and different usage. Um, so, you know, use this guideline and workbook to help you make the most informed um, decision you can for each individual project. Yes, I, I agree. I think, again, um, I, it kind of goes back to, you know, I've looked at a lot of buildings as have you, and I just think that if you follow those two simple rules, you walk out of there with equipment that is efficient and you can probably do just about anything to the envelope and know that the installation in that context is going to be safe. If you're designing your you know, combustion safety strategy with the 
um, thought from the beginning in mind that we're going to have a very tight building, um, you know, then uh, um, basically you're free to make that building as tight as you want and not have to worry about the systems that you, you know, put in place for combustion safety. Yep. I think we've covered all of those uh, definitions I was just checking. And again, I'll leave that little our two rules uh, back on the board. But thank you so much for your uh, time, Steve, and your great commentary. And uh, thank you, Alex Powell, for helping us out on this. And with that, I think we will end the webinar.